So it's either side of the divide, either people that feel that you can use cells from that embryo or uh, people that feel you cannot use cells from that embryo. And our role as scientists is to explain what the biological potential is of those embryos. It's not to tell people what they need to think or decide or for us to persuade them about what their choice might be in that case. Greetings, I'm Yvonne, staff for Science for the Public, and I welcome you to our Contemporary Science Issues and Innovations program. One innovation that has been particularly controversial is stem cell research. Developments in this field uh, offer huge medical advances, but there are numerous misunderstandings about stem cells in general, and in particular, the uh, stem cell research. Our guest, Dr. Jonathan Garlick, has been a pioneer in this field and also a leader in communicating science. Dr. Garlick is professor and director of the Division of Cancer Biology and Tissue Engineering at the University of Tufts Medical School, and he's also the founder and director of the Tufts Initiative in Civic Science. We are very fortunate to have him with us today. Welcome, Dr. Garlick. Thank you, Yvonne. I'm very happy to be here, and I'm really eager and curious to hear what questions the audience has <laughs> today about stem cells. A whole bunch of questions, right. Uh, so I think we know that we're made of cells, <laughs> and so we have muscle cells and blood cells and all of that, but there's a lot of misunderstanding about some stem cells, so could you tell us that for starters? What are those? So I think there's a, uh, we all need a basic definition of what <laughs> stem cells are. So I would put it this way. Uh, why are these cells different from all other cells mm -hmm, in our body? Mm -hmm. And the answer is that stem cells have two unique properties. The first is that when they divide, they make two different cells. One cell that they make is another copy of that stem cell. Mm -hmm. So the stem cell is constantly replenishing itself. We call that process self-renewal. The second cell then goes on to become the functional part of that tissue. But the stem cell stays behind. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit like you would imagine like a seed in the soil, mm -hmm. where the seed undergoes growth, the plant grows, but the seed stays behind to replenish more plants. Exactly the same thing. So we have the ability of these cells to self-renew. They stay behind in the tissue, but they also give rise to cells that can what we call differentiate or specialize into particular tissue types, whether it's skin or blood lung or, yeah. or blood, and that's how we define that cell. Two unique properties that only stem cell has. Many cell types divide, but give rise to identical cell types. The stem cell is unique and that it gives rise to itself and it stays behind to create and replenish more tissues. Okay, that's what we really want to get clear. That's just starters. And then there are these two types. And before we get into the research part of things, the embryonic stem mm -hmm. cells and then what are called the adult stem cells. Could you give us a clue there? So it's important to think about stem cells in two general categories. One, as you mentioned, are pluripotent stem cells. Mm -hmm. Those are stem cells that have the potential, that's why we call them pluripotent, they have potency to become any cell type in the body. Right. The second type are what we call adult stem cells or tissue-specific stem cells. Their potency is to, their potential is to develop only the tissue types in the tissue in which they reside. So there are tissue-specific skin stem cells, tissue-specific tissue blood stem cells, tissue-specific stem cells that make hair, those are tissue-specific. But when it comes to pluripotency, they can make every cell type in the body. And there are two different types of pluripotent stem cells. One are cells that we call human embryonic stem cells. They come from the uh, central part of a four-day-old embryo. And those cells can become any cell type in the body 
except for placenta. Mm -hmm. So we call them pluripotent. The second type of pluripotent stem cells are stem cells that we call induced pluripotent stem cells. Those are cells that have been created by reversing a tissue-specific cell. It doesn't even have to be a tissue-specific stem cell. Any specific stem, any specific cell can be reversed and, in a, in a sense, uh, reprogramming that cell so it has the qualities and features of an embryonic-like cell, meaning induced pluripotent stem cells derived from a tissue-specific region of the body, commonly done from skin and blood, acquire pluripotency. Mm -hmm. And we'll talk a little bit more about how they're being used as a relatively uncontroversial source of pluripotent stem cells. That, was a, that is a, an issue. That is a concern, definitely. So when the, the, these uh, embryonic cells are taken, where, what's the source? for that typically? What is this in vitro uh, the source? So if they're truly embryonic and not embryo-like cells, if they're truly embryonic, they're taken from a four-day-old embryo. The center of that cluster of cells in the embryo is the inner cell mass, and that's where these pluripotent cells come from. There are technologies that have been around for close to 25 years to take cells from a living embryo, mm -hmm. most commonly from in vitro fertilization That's, uh, right. uh, uh, products, and you remove cells from that viable embryo, you grow those cells in vitro, which means in a laboratory environment, in a laboratory dish. Uh, the problem is when you remove the cells from the embryo, that embryo is no longer viable. Mm -hmm. That was ethically controversial. So the alternative to that is to take adult cells from an adult skin, and Shinya Yamanaka won a Nobel Prize yeah. for this several years ago, by reprogramming, or essentially pushing the development of those cells back to an embryonic-like mm -hmm. state. Mm -hmm. They are not derived from an embryo, they are derived from an adult, but miraculously they acquire the properties that are very, very similar to cells that you would derive from a human embryo. That's the next question. That is a, like a, a tremendous breakthrough right there. And uh, remove this controversy. Uh, one of the things first to mm -hmm. go back to the embryonic ones, th does this usually come from when uh, uh, people have the, uh, uh, not direct fertilization, but laboratory fer fertilization, so forth, and you throw out a lot from that, correct? Do they use that for the embryonic stem cell research? Uh, so the source Those leftovers, things so that would be left behind. So the source is uh, in vitro fertilization clinic frozen embryos. They're, they're not thrown out, but there are extra embryos that are created upon in vitro fertilization. Those uh, embryos are not leftovers, they're actually frozen and stored because well, yeah, they yeah. are the property of the individuals that donated the egg and the sperm. Right, right, right. But the controversy swelling, swirling around the use of human embryonic stem cells is whether or not those frozen embryos are uh, allowed to be used for the derivation of embryonic stem cells because, as I said, the destruction of those embryos will happen when those cells are derived. And now I think what we, what we need to think about in this controversy, uh, and I'll, I'll use my pen tip to illustrate that, we're talking about a four-day-old embryo which can right. sit on the tip of this pen point. And if people feel that that frozen embryo is a form of life that has the potential to become a fetus and a human, then they would decide uh, as to on one side of the stem cell debate, what should be done with that embryo. Uh, if people feel that the little embryo that's sitting on the tip of this pen is something that it needs to be protected, then they would preserve that embryo and would not tamper with it and feel that, uh, so it's either side of the divide, either people that feel that you can use cells from that embryo or uh, people that feel you cannot use cells from that embryo and our role as scientists is to explain what the biological potential is of those embryos. It's not to tell people what they need to think or decide or for us to persuade them about what their choice might be in that case. Right, but is that actually the, the argument 
from the conservative side was, well, that's life, you're destroying life. But for a scientist, I'm not sure that that is the case. That's not a viable embryo or anything like that, right? Well, if we know that, uh, and science provides evidence that uh, the cells that are in that four day old embryo are dividing and alive, and if implanted into a uterus, we know that they could become a fetus. So I think there's a, a choice here that people need to decide for themselves. Uh, we, the scientists, need to tell the people uh, what they should do, what science can do, what the opportunity is that science provides, but uh, rather than telling people uh, what they need to do. So I think it's up to people to decide for themselves uh, what science uh, should do for themselves, and we as scientists need to explain to them what science can do. Right, so let's go then to w what can be done, and you were a pioneer in a lot of that research. So these, if you are working with these stem cells, you can generate tissue, all sorts of things, uh, replace, mm -hmm. fix, uh, and, and so on. And you've worked with disease, you've worked with everything. Could you please tell us what you have done with it so that we have an idea what does a scientist do with these things? So our experiments are to create a lab-made skin mm -hmm. that closely mimics the form and function of human skin. So we can study how skin diseases develop in the laboratory. Uh, it's very important for us to use stem cells to make normal skin because, as we know, stem cells are what creates and replenishes uh, tissues and gives mm -hmm. them mm -hmm. viability. Mm -hmm. So what we do in our lab is we take sources of adult tissue stem cells from skin and make it into a skin that looks just like skin that we have in our body. So we can study skin diseases as they develop. Now the question is, what's the best source of stem cells mm -hmm. for making that skin? Mm -hmm. We know we can make excellent skin from adult stem cells, but our scientific question is, can we use pluripotent stem cells? Because if we use pluripotent stem cells, as I said, pluripotent stem cells can make every cell type in the body. Mm -hmm. So if we use pluripotent stem cells, we could make all the different cell types that are present in skin, including the blood vessels, including the immune cells, all the cell types from one patient. And that moves us closer to being able to study personalized and individualized treatments for patients using our skin as the model system right. for allowing us to study skin in a way that is optimal. Is this the organotypic uh, uh, models that you have worked on that was just skin? Right. So we call them organotypic cultures, which closely simulate the form and function of normal skin. Okay, and you've done a number of different kinds of things. Is there anything else in your research that you want to tell us about there that you have developed? So we work in our lab and care a lot about chronic disease. Mm -hmm. We work very closely with the patients that have scleroderma who generously donate their cells so we can make skin that closely simulates scleroderma. We also uh, try to understand people that have diabetic wounds mm -hmm. on their feet that do not heal, why that happens. And we also get donations from individuals that have wounds that do not heal. We take cells from those patients and we create skin that mimics those disease conditions to a very high degree. So we call this disease models. And we can uh, use a lab-made skin, which I have to say, more closely recapitulates the way the disease developed in humans than it does when scientists study diseases on a plastic dish. So we believe that our what we call organotypic or three-dimensional cultures mm -hmm. are a more effective way to test drugs for these terrible diseases, the way we can understand why these diseases are caused, 
and hopefully move towards cures more quickly by developing these organotypic models of disease. Right, and so far, these developments like the skin, has it, have they, are they viable? Can you yet replace damaged skin or uh, wounds from uh, 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 the diabetes and so on? Can you replace that yet with your skin? So that artificial. technology has been available for quite a while. Okay. And what's amazing about there's a company called Organogenesis that recreates lab-made skin and sells it as a therapeutic for non-healing wounds on people's feet. Mm -hmm. And the reason it works, it works as a therapeutic band-aid because it's a lab-made skin that simulates the properties of human skin. That tissue, when somebody comes to a clinic because of a non-healing wound on their foot, they layer that on top mm. of the wound and that skin tissue, which is from another donor, that skin tissue produces therapeutic molecules, therapeutic products that actually stimulate wound healing That's below in yeah, the non-healing yeah, right, wound. Right. It provides the products and the factors that the indiv individual who has advanced diabetes cannot make for themselves. Right, right. So it works in a majority of cases, but there's still many cases in which I'm it doesn't sure, work. And that's right. what our lab hopes to do is to figure right. out ways that we can treat these right, ulcers right, more right. effectively and more efficiently. The right. But it's a stem cell product. Right. Yeah, there are right. adult stem cells from skin in that product, otherwise you, it wouldn't grow. Right, got it. Okay, now there's one more. Uh, uh, in terms of this general background, there have been recent breakthroughs here that are very exciting, and it's called model human embryos. And I'm sure that will be controversial too, but could you give us some ideas because this is very exciting for the science. It's exciting for the science and it's likely going to raise some controversial thoughts, raising, I would say, some of the old moral yes. concerns about embryonic research. Uh, but I have to make the point that these lab-made creations are quite different yes. from real human embryos and we call them stem cell based embryo models. Mm -hmm. Some people might call them synthetic embryos. I think that that title doesn't really explain exactly right. what they're and, doing. And model uh, yes. embryonic, yeah. So similar to the way I described the way we make organotypic tissues in three dimensions, these uh, stem cell based embryo models are made by uh, taking human stem cells, most commonly derived from the induced pluripotent stem cells that I described a moment ago, putting them in a dish, and giving them a little chemical nudge to kind of kickstart a process where the cells are gonna organize themselves into a three-dimensional structure that resemble uh, a natural human embryo at the earliest stages of its development. And the headline is, it can be done without the need for sperm or eggs. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's, this is really um, a big step forward, isn't it though? Uh, do, do you think it will be uh, like viable like pretty soon or is it still very uh, in the initial stages? Well this is in the initial stages of research but there's no question that these uh, stem cell based embryo models are viable and they have properties that mimic human embryos right. and I think why they're important and why they're going to continue to be developed is that uh, they can help scientists understand problems of early pregnancy. There Very is this, early. There yeah. is, yes, and we would call it this black box period yes, of development thank you. that is usually between six to twenty-eight days post-fertilization yeah. of a of an embryo in its development. And by modeling this in vitro in a yes. laboratory in a in a defined environment, we'll be able to develop new understandings, for example, of why pregnancies fail right. or causes of developmental disorders, because that's the state and phase at which they occur and it could lead to new understandings and better understandings of infertility and better understandings of birth defects. And right. it's been impossible to study that because we haven't had a model that recreates that black right. box window of day six to 28 post-fertilization. But again, this is done without fertilization. Right, uh, thank you for that because th that is news, I think, for most of us that, well, they don't know mm -hmm. anything about that period and it's a critical period, that very, very early period. Uh, if you knew more about that, you could answer a whole lot of exactly. questions about developmental problems or disease in some cases and, and uh, so on. So it's uh, really looking forward to hearing more about yeah, that. Yeah, and I think it's fair to say that people that are listening in today might have some concerns about whether these embryo models can become babies. <laughs> Yeah, oh, and yes, that's going to be raising 
concerns, and I can say that as of now, the science does tell us, uh, if you want to do a reality check, that no, uh, these right. embryo models cannot produce a baby. And one of the reasons is that they are derived from these induced pluripotent stem cells. Right. Okay. And when you create induced pluripotent stem cells, you remove the parental imprints from the DNA. It's like you scrub the DNA and really strip them of their full developmental potential. So they lose the ability to de develop into a viable fetus. Right. So that will mitigate against any concerns about them becoming a, uh, a baby. Yes, thank you for that yeah, information. I think that clarification that put, is really important. Yes, that's very important uh, because that will be uh, already in the science community, it seems like people are a little impatient about this because the, this is settled science. Uh, they know this much. Uh, but, uh, but I would say, it, uh, just think uh, one step further, that it's still important to have discourse course, and public course, awareness right, because right, as right. this technology evolves, we're going to need public input I, I, exact. as to what level of oversight right. we should have going right. forward. Um, and we're getting low, a little bit low on time. So I was concerned mm -hmm. about the shutdowns that had occurred that just very brief mm -hmm. briefly, because we want to go on to the communicating science, the work that you have done, um, that uh, uh, it, the, this, this particular research had been shut down several times and then revived mm -hmm. by the government uh, at, right at the top. and. What does that do to the state of research? So that's a personal experience that I had. Yes. Uh, back <laughs> in 2010, yeah. I had a grant from the government to study how to make embryonic stem cells into skin. And overnight, uh, I was uh, became aware, or I should say, uh, was not aware of the ethical, political, moral, <laughs> and legal consequences of work that I was doing in my own lab. So I had to stop doing all of my embryo-derived research. I wasn't deriving the embryos myself, and I was using cells from the embryos. And uh, the way I would describe it is you know, doing, having a research lab and changing direction in research, it's not like a motorboat that changes. It's more like a luxury liner that you're trying to turn around because mm -hmm. you have so much momentum. You have graduate students. You have other people right, studying right, certain. Right. So this is changing direction is a slow and gradual process. It took a couple of years until wow. I could reorient my lab into using the recently discovered induced pluripotent stem cells to right, ask the same right. questions I would have asked exactly. embryonic stem cells. Exactly, you lost that much time. I lost, So yes. uh, I thank you for that because they, it, there is, it really hurts the research in general, I guess, but also you have graduate students, they don't have forever, mm -hmm. and uh, people are just uh, stymied with this. Uh, so you have, you have pointed out that the uh, the the system got back uh, because of some private funding. Mm -hmm. Excuse me on that. I need to transition quickly to your communication yes. uh, project. You were a leader in that as well in terms of communicating science. Help us out here. What does your program do, and how do you do it? So I I think it's a very important question because there's a. Uh, an op-ed in today's New York Times written by Anthony Mills that uh, says that 69% people have confidence that science is able to act in its public interest mm -hmm. as compared to 86% before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So clearly there's an issue here and uh, our civic science initiative at Tufts uh, is moving forward in this time of polarization to ask a really important question. And that is, how are we collectively, as a society, going to talk to each other about divisive, polarizing, complex science issues at a time of intense societal polarization? Mm -hmm. And we study that as well. What we found, on one hand, there is politicization of science information uh, based on ideology, which is concerning, uh, but at the same time, uh, our research and others' research shows that there is uh, what I would call an anti-science attitude due to a lack of trust in science and scientists. And what we found is that uh, it is the responsibility and accountability of scientists to be more worthy of public trust. And our science communication approach offers a new type of science communication with the public 
Uh, our sci civic science initiative, initiative works to make science more trustworthy and inclusive. The typical model of science communication has been that scientists possess critical knowledge that non-scientists lack, and all we need to do is fill the vessel with knowledge and narrow those gaps, and it's a one-way flow of information. And the layperson will trust what we share and trust the science. It turns out that, that what we call deficit model of science communication doesn't work well. So in our civic science model, we make the case that non-scientific forms of knowledge, including cultural and experiential knowledge, are considered to have equal value to science knowledge. And it's not that science knowledge is dominant over other types of knowledge. Our civic science approach says evidence matters, but it's not sufficient for people to decide what they need to do or how they might act based on that science information. So it's pretty clear that we need a bi-directional conversation with the public that I would say is a search for mutual understanding so scientists can better understand what people care about related to the science issues that are important to them. And there's also an equity lens here, meaning uh, we need to be talking about science in ways that are attentive to historical practices and identities of individuals that have not always been invited to the table to share in these conversations. So our science literacy program uh, is trying to create a new climate for engagement on science issues by flipping the conversation. Historically, people are saying, oh, those of you who don't trust science need to trust us more. What we say and our work says in civic science says we need to flip that conversation because some of the responsibility for the distrust in science is on science and scientists. So our approach says we can tell you as scientists what we know, but we can tell you what you should do. Scientists are informants of knowledge. We are not persuaders or convincers. So we believe that we can train scientists to earn public trust to listen more, hold their expertise lightly. And this is a communication approach that's really designed to bring in voices that have not been represented in now, science do do, discourse. Yes. Do you do this like through courses at Tufts or uh, for the students or uh, public kinds of things? What, how do you do this? So our goal is to train scientists at all career stages with that awareness. We train them to build trustworthiness when they engage with the public. We teach them how to foster dialogue that promotes listening and inclusion. We give them skills and, and sensibilities to ensure that all voices and knowledge are respected. And we teach this through courses at Tufts for undergraduate students. I do this in one of my roles at Tufts, which is through our Clinical Translational Sciences Institute, where we train scientists, training physicians, community members, because we said it's a bi-directional mm -hmm. conversation. And what we hope to embed in that, and that's so one example I'll give you, is we create these community-based, what we call civic science roundtables. We bring together community members, we bring together care providers, we bring together scientists. The topic could be about human cloning, the topic could be about the value of the human embryo, and bring people together in dialogue so they can listen to each other's values, beliefs, and experiences. And if I could sum it up in one sentence, what I've experienced, people emerge from those conversations having a sense of wonder, not only about the science, but about each other. Do you, uh, this, this is focused on stem cell uh, the, the, uh, research. It's not like climate science and all the other vaccines, all the other things that have been controversial. Your focus in that group is the stem cell. It's any topic, it's not just stem cells. I it's see. any topic that the public, especially historically underrepresented individuals, feel they need to have a voice in. So what we do is we go out into communities 
We listen to the concerns that the community have around any health-related issues. So we just completed health -related, a okay. big dialogue program where the question was, what do people think and feel about COVID vaccination? Mm -hmm. It was a listening space. It was not a persuading space. We have these, I'm, I'm a scientist. I know how hard it is to create new knowledge. Mm -hmm. It's very hard and very humbling. And we have knowledge that can shift the health of the public. But again, we are listening. We are mm -hmm. leading with listening and sometimes need to hold our expertise lightly so we can truly understand what people think and feel about COVID vaccination. And we've had this very large dialogue, community dialogue study and learn from that that many people have a life experience that has led them to not trust science. And what we learn that if the messenger of the science information is not trusted, it's quite likely the message will not be trusted either. Okay, all right. Thank you very much for that. Uh, very briefly, have you experienced a lot of success with that? I mean, we're looking at things like the vaccine, we still have a real problem with it and, and so on. Do you regard this as a successful approach? Have you, do you have any measures to show? Yes, we have measures. And I would say that the success of our approach is that it's making the invisible visible. Mm -hmm. We are able to understand the complexities of people's thinking around these very uncertain, challenging, controversial, and polarizing science issues. Okay, thank you for that. And now, should we go to the questions? Uh, okay. Great. Of all your discoveries, would you please let us know the one you believe was the most helpful in improving human health? Of your discoveries. Question. I love that question. I bet you do. <laughs> so thank you for that question. Uh, of all my discoveries, I would say when we figured out how to grow artificial skin in the laboratory, we took a, uh, a leap forward and being able to closely recreate a living human tissue that we call lab-made skin opened up an incredible realm of possibilities to study human disease in ways that were not otherwise possible. And I think what's most meaningful about that breakthrough is that it, you know, they say a rising tide raises all ships. That technology could be shared with people that are studying diseases, not just of skin, but other diseases of tissues that are similar to skin, the human cervix, the esophagus. I'm also a dentist, so it's very helpful to study the tissues in the oral You're cavity. real interested in that. <laughs> very personally interested, as many of our <laughs> listeners <laughs> and viewers are. So that's what I would say. And it was possible because we really understood the nature of stem cells. Okay, and the next question is, what's the future for stem cell research? What are the most important prospects? So I would say that the, uh, what I described as stem cell-based embryo models provides some unique opportunities for really understanding how uh, stem cells behave in a developing human embryo. And uh, there's a lot of interest in understanding that black box period. That's definitely one area, but that's front of mind because that's a, that's a very, very recent uh, discovery. But I think one of the other areas, I mentioned the induced pluripotent stem cells that are derived from adult skin that are relatively uncontroversial compared mm -hmm. to deriving the same cells or very similar cells from a human embryo. We have uh, a lot of research and ongoing clinical trials to show that different cell and tissue types that are derived from these induced pluripotent stem cells can be used for human therapy. Now, why is that a breakthrough? And in some ways, even more advantageous than cells derived from human embryos. So here's a scenario. You take a piece of skin from me, I'm an adult. You take that to the laboratory. You then push those cells back Mm -hmm. developmentally to embryo-like cells, and then you could make those cells into multiple mm -hmm. tissue types mm -hmm. that could be used 
as a therapy, if you want to make cells that are going to be similar to retina, make cells from my IPS, my induced pluripotent stem cells that mimic retina, and they could use that as a human mm -hmm, therapy. Mm -hmm. You could make cells, it's like the goose that lays the golden egg. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You can continually derive cells that will be multiple cell types, multiple tissue types, all for designed for human therapy that could be quite personalized, individualized to a particular person because I donated those cells. They're not going to be rejected by my body. That's wow, isn't it? That's really exciting. <laughs> it is the future of healing. It well, is the future I should of say, medical disease. Oh, yeah. And it has an incredible potential. Absolutely. That, that uh, is being realized by an incredible community of stem cell researchers. Right. And the International Society of Stem Cell Research is incredible as a galvanizing, galvanizing force and bringing researchers together to not only consider what can become possible as a result of science, but what ethical considerations should also sure. be brought to bear. Right. And I would highly recommend to our uh, listeners and viewers to go to the International Society of Stem Cell Research website and to learn. There's a huge amount of information there that's curated and very accessible to the general public. And one more thing here to squeeze in if we can. Uh, how did you get in, you yourself, get into stem cell research? What, what brought you to that? Uh, so as I said, it really it came from my clinical experience treating human disease as uh -huh. a cancer expert, uh, treating diseases in the oral uh -huh. cavity. And, uh, seeing the suffering of patients with oral cancer uh, drove me to think about ways that we can both make replacement tissues but also understand cancer in a fundamental way and in order to do that I dedicated myself to figuring out how we could best make tissues that would simulate those disease processes and once I started to do that, I was swept away I'll by bet. what I would call <laughs> the magic of stem cells and the yeah. incredible potential that they have to bestow beneficial gifts yeah, on yeah. humanity. And you hit it at just the right time, I guess, although right now is a really exciting... It feels like every time is the right yeah, time I for guess, stem cells. I guess, I guess. But thank you. Yeah, that thank is you for great. Thank you so much for all of that. And if we have time, can he sing a little bit of... Uh, Dr. Garlic has oh developed rap songs uh, around communicating science, and they are very, very charming. And I, uh, we weren't sure whether we could <laughs> work one in today or not, but if we can, even a part of one, is that possible? Bravo, oh, great. Okay. you're so, on. So I have to say, this is a really meaningful part of my science communication with the public. <laughs> I rap about all things science, all things stem cells, and uh, also do bar mitzvahs, weddings, if anybody's <laughs> interested, uh, very topical. So I, I'll just do a couple of verses. So I really rap about, I'm a pathologist also, so people really don't know what a pathologist does. So I decided to write a little tune called I See Cells Done to the Tune of Baby Got Back, which some of our listeners may remember. It goes something like this. I like stem cells and I cannot lie. My microscope will not deny that when I see a slide and this round things in my face, I feel stuck because this is tough. And I'm seeing lots of stuff that's pink and blue and scary. I'm hooked and I can't stop staring. Oh, baby, I want to see cancer and find the answer. But all I see is cells and even that I can't see well. That's just a little taste of that. And then I did a little something about uh, <laughs> Grandmaster Flash. Some of you, I'm kind of an old school guy, old school rapper, so Grandmaster Flash. Uh, as you probably remember the message, and now 50 years of hip hop, everybody's replaying that. So a real little, real little rap about what could go wrong in dentistry and medicine. Uh, like dentistry's got me close to the edge. I'm trying not to lose my head. Uh, had myself some herpes and hepatitis B, touching all those germs, it's just not healthy. Taking x-rays in the day and I'm glowing at night. So tertiary system, it gave me a fright. Sometimes I'm feeling so confused. With mercury, my brain's perfused. The worst thing all that happened to me was a physiologic emergency. My patient started getting sweaty and I wasn't ready to treat all the signs of syncope. His pressure shot up to 210. I knew deep inside, right about then I gotta give him a dose. I don't know what, gotta try to differentially diagnose. I injected all the drugs that I know of three beta blockers and some insulin. 
all those drugs didn't get very far. Better brush up on my CPR. Uh, you get the idea. It's wonderful. Actually, uh, a uh, great way for kids. I go to high schools, middle schools, talk about stem cells. It, after that. it becomes an indelible experience when right. I actually deliver yeah, something right. and wrap that line in verse. That is great. You're quite an artist on the side Thank there. You. You're right, Thank you. I right, take great right. Pride you in could that have communication been famous with all of that. You should really get this you stuff think I have out a there. Right, right. Well, I've, I've been called the great greatest stem cell artist uh, who looks like an accountant by <laughs> many, many, many people. So. <laughs> but thank you ever so much. Thank you. Thank I'm you. really delighted we were able to get that so little bit of wrap in there. Keep thank it you. up. Thank, and you, thank you. Okay. Thank you all.